everyone. Thanks very much for coming. I'm Molly Starback, Director of the Duke Office of Postdoctoral Services, and I'd like to welcome you to today's NIH F32 session with four of our Duke Postdoc F32 awardees. This is the third session in our spring F32 K99 series. After this, we're going to switch gears to the K99. If you're on the postdoc list, then you know about that. It's also on the postdoc website. Um, if you need more details, just look at either of those places or email me, Molly Starback. So today we are welcoming Michael Brown, who is a postdoctoral scholar in the Department of Neurosurgery. His F32 is from NCI. And Casey Gordon is a postdoc scholar in the Department of Biology. Her F32 is from NIGMS. Chris Casotis is a postdoctoral scholar in the Nick School of the Environment. His F32 is from NIEHS. And Cameron Priga is a postdoc scholar in the Department of Neurobiology. She was awarded an F32 from NEI. And several of you submitted questions in advance. Thank you for doing that. We'll start with those, but feel free to jump in if you have questions yourself. So first question, if you could tell us a little bit about your background, so your department, your area of research, how long you've been a postdoc. Would you like to yeah, sure. That? So I've been a postdoc since June 1st, 2016 in Department of Neurosurgery. My research focuses on using uh, recombinant polyvirus to treat breast, brain, and melanoma cancer. Um, so the specific question I'm addressing within that project is studying how immunization as children with polio may actually be one of the factors determining therapy success in treatment of polio virus. I started my postdoc in biology in January of 2015, um, and I'm in a cell biology lab in the biology department um, using the nematode CLNs as a model system, which I also worked on in grad school. And so why I bring this up is that one of the things that your F32 will be scored on is its training potential. And so something that will that'll ding your application is if what you're working on as a postdoc is seen as too closely related in, in any major way to what you've already done in grad school. Um, and so one thing that my, my advisor and I were cognizant of as I was putting my uh, application research plan and training plan together was to highlight the ways that, well, my expertise using the worm is going to help me accomplish my goals, but I'm going to be learning, you know, in, in grad school I studied evolution of gene regulation. What I'm going to be learning is a whole different area of biology, and I'm going to learn how to do confocal microscopy, and like a list of some of the more technical things that I would be trained in that I, that I didn't already know from doing the PhD in worms. Um, and so, so that's something that, that you can consider um, playing up the differences you want, to, you want your background to show that you're qualified, but you want to also make it clear that you have a lot of room to grow. Uh, yeah, so again, I'm Chris Casotis. Uh, so I started here in September 2015 uh, after getting my PhD at University of Missouri. Uh, and broadly, I study endocrine disrupting chemicals. Uh, so more specifically, I'm looking at how exposure to kind of common, uh, particularly indoor contaminants, may uh, affect your metabolic health. So uh, whether they may be contributing to some of these chronic metabolic health conditions, like obesity, diabetes, etc. And I've been here about three years now. Um, Cameron, I've been here also about three years. I joined neurobiology in July of 2015, and I'm studying the retinal development. I'm looking at how molecules are directing formation of circuits, and with the hope to look later into develop into maturity and see how those circuits can be disrupted in retinal generative diseases. Great, thank you. So, could you describe your experience applying for the F32, or did any of you have to reapply, or did you all get a first go? I I had to reapply, but I ended up getting the first submission because I think sometimes if you get a better score your second submission, they might just award you the first. I don't know how common that is, but the award wasn't for the second one, it was the first one. What was the timing for I had already I had resubmitted, and I got my score for the resubmission, and then a couple weeks later, I got the announcement that was for the first one. So it was probably like six to eight months. So I had, I would, my score was right on the edge. So they give you a predictive uh, pay line score. So you'll get your impact score and your percentile. And you don't really know what to do with that unless you talk to the uh, um, program officer, thank you. Um, and uh, unless it's like really, really high or something. But uh, mine was like right on the edge. 
And so I thought about reapplying, but I talked to the program officer and she said just wait. Because apparently your second submission, it might be institute specific, I'm not sure, but she said that for NCI, if you resubmit your grant, they're going to use the new scores. And so if those were worse, you'd negate it the first round. So if you're marginal, definitely talk to the program officer. So that's something to pay attention to that Tom mentioned. And I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the standard score is, is you can submit in February, in July, and in October. Is that correct? And then the resubmissions would be March, August, and November. The way it works is if you've applied in the January cycle, you will have gotten your scores back probably by the June, but you won't yet know if you've gotten your award. And so just for your own planning, if you want to give yourself an app, a primary application, and then a resubmission cycle, don't think you're going to make the consecutive resubmission. Yeah. So it's going to be, if you apply in January, the earliest you should plan to resubmit is the October deadline. Because you need to get your score back, find out if it's funded, but also you're going to get a summary statement that will tell you how your two or three, however many reviewers, felt about your application, and then what was the consensus of, from the room when it was discussed. And that's really helpful, because that'll help you That'll help steer you towards any of the deficiencies that the reviewers identified and help you improve it for the next cycle. Um, and so this is something that I just timing-wise is good to be aware of. Yeah, so I also resubmitted, and I think my word of caution would be, particularly if you're changing research areas a bit, to not go in too early, uh, because I think that was the major criticism of my application. So like I came in uh, in September and I submitted December. Um, so I was just like getting up to speed with what I was even researching as a postdoc um, and really didn't have the ability to put together a great application. So it felt really rushed, one, um, and things like figuring out the training plan. Um, I was still a little unsure what I even was doing um, moving forward. So I would say, yeah, give yourself some time. Um, <clears throat> and then, yeah, so so just mirroring that, that I got my review statement, my summary statement back maybe like, I feel like a week or two before the next the consecutive uh, submission deadline. So there was no way to turn your, around your application based on that feedback that quickly. Um, so I waited two to reapply um, and then got it up at that time. Um, but I think like one of my big things was just like your reviewers are tired, they're not spending a lot of time on your application, so like make things as easy for them as you can. Um, like I think two two other other than the fact that everything is a little rushed, um, two things that I remember them saying were that my um, my like RCR training plan was not didn't meet the standards, uh, which it exceeded the standards. But I made sure on my reapplication I said straight out in that little essay, this exceeds the standards. Um, and then they didn't have any problems with it after that. <laughs> um, and then uh, the other one was, so I had a experiment in my, uh, my research plan that called for some review activity uh, work. Uh, and what I didn't specify was that I had the training and the facilities to do the radioactive work, which strikes me as just crazy because I'm like, of course, I'm, no one's letting me do radioactive work without that, without that, that radioactive lab. But because I didn't specify it, they scored me a 10, um, which is the worst in that section. Um, and that was like their only critique. And I was like, okay. So, that was a very easy thing to fix. Especially um, in the environmental health school. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very silly yep. yeah. <laughs> So yeah, so just, yeah, even the stupid things, make sure you spell out for them, I would say. And I think that's a really good example of every different part of the document is important. And they have a lot of people that are submitting, and they need to weed people out somehow. So if something's weak, that's what they're going to go after. So you want to make sure that every document is strong. I know RCR was one that people told me that they usually got dinged on. So that was something too that I had to make sure was really, really top notch. Yeah. yeah. So that, and Chris, you just brought up a, a good point, which was one of our next questions like, what, when should you apply? So not at the very beginning, certainly not at the very end. I mean, do you want to wait until you actually have? 
preliminary data, or is that not as important because it's supposed to be a training grant? Like what? So I, I waited a little long on the other on the other extreme. I came to Duke in January and I submitted in the October deadline. And I got two years of funding instead of three. Because by the time they had made the funding decision and announced it, like sent the first check was like the maybe the following August. And they said, Oh, well now you now you're in your second year of your postdoc. But I applied during the first year, it's not my fault, it takes you eight months to, <laughs> to make up your mind that's what they um, but but that was some, so that's something to be aware of that you can get three years, two years, or one year of F32 funding, and where you are in your career is going to depend where where they draw that line. Um, and so I would say maybe don't do the very first cycle after you arrive, but also don't don't wait too too long um, because then you're just losing some time. Can I ask a follow up? Is it like bad? Or like, what does that mean if you only get like two years or three years? That's not going to impact like your later funding, right? They're just saying you're further along. No, but but it, but it's one fewer year that will be covered, right? Of your postdoc. Yeah. I just also want to point out. So I just got an F32. Um, okay. They also. Uh, Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> they also. Um, I asked for three years so that it would complete my postdoc, and I don't know if anybody else has been involved with the most recent funding cycle, but kind of across the board, at least in NIGMS and an ICAD, uh, those two ICs both cut like everybody's across the board. So my mentor was 10% off of her R01 for every year, and my F32 got cut by one year. So the three that I was counting on to finish the last three years of my postdoc didn't come through. I only got two out of those three, because I guess the change happened after they'd already established pay lines. So mm -hmm. instead of redoing the pay line, they just cut everybody's by enough to keep who they had on pay line funded. Um, so that's another thing to be aware of when you put in, the years that you put in, I think the idea used to be the F32 was going to cover the bulk of your postdoc, um, but that may not be the case just because of a funding situation. So that's another thing maybe is to project out, look at your K99 eligibility, if you're, if you're on the tenure track career path, then that's a great mechanism if you're eligible for the F32, you'll be eligible for the K99, and say, okay, the last, the last resubmission I could do for a K99 would be this one, so then my first admission should be that one, and so then I want to be covered by my F32 at least through when that funding announcement will be made. And fingers crossed, try again. I think piggybacking on that, I think the K99 is what drives the F32 timing a little bit too, because in the eyes of the NIH, they want you to follow their, you know, pathway to to becoming an independent investigator that involves a K99 as well. So I think that's why the F32 seems like it can be truncated, truncated if you're too far along in the postdoc. But I don't think it's, if you get the F32, I think it's still for career purposes, even if you just get one year, I'm sure it's just as good as three years. Other questions? So how do you know when you're competitive enough? It's like it's not just the clock ticking, right? But how do you know when you have you know, enough publications, enough research? I would say don't hold out for a postdoc publication before you submit your F32. That becomes important for the K99. Um, but it's, it's expected that the F32 is for early career postdocs. You need to know enough to know that you can put together a good application. And I, I tried some different foundation fellowships earlier in my postdoc, and, and they, my application suffered from what you were describing, where I was still too new to the field. And so, you know, either, either the questions that I was saying I was going to answer were not maybe impactful enough, or my approaches were a little bit high in the sky, like, it's not going to work, and, you know, a few months later I realized it, it wouldn't. But, so give yourself enough, enough time to get up to speed, make a convincing case that you're going to do what you're going to do. But don't, don't wait till you have a publication from your postdoc lab, and definitely don't let your PI tell you, oh no, don't bother applying this cycle, wait till you have a publication, that will make you more competitive. That just means I don't want to look at this right now and install it. It's not, it's, it's not good advice. And what's the, I mean, realistically, are you going to have a paper in four months? Because that's when the next deadline is. No? Okay, let's submit it this time. That lets you reason. I think it also might be field dependent, but I based my proposal on preliminary data that was from a collaboration that our lab had. So a lot of it wasn't my preliminary data, but it's what I got my hypotheses from. So if you're in a position where you have some good ideas and they're based on like previously published work, I mean, better that it has something to do with the lab that you're working in. It's also something that's acceptable. 
Yeah, I would say mentoring plan. Uh, mentors and mentoring plan. Like I think most most people who I've talked to who I went to grad school with who have applied for F-32s and didn't get them. Um, that I've talked to about it, uh, they were like, you know, my, my research plan was solid, I don't know what the problem was. Um, and by and large, all of them had mentors who hadn't been funded by that institute. Um, and that's just a critical piece. You need a mentor that has been funded by the institute that you're applying for. Uh, and if you don't have one, you should get a co-mentor that has, um, because that's something that they wait a lot. Um, so as much as they're ranking you and your further potential, they also want to know that like you're going to be able to get there because they have you have mentors who they also think a lot of and have funded, um, and isn't someone who they've never heard of. So. And who have trained postdocs in the past. Yeah. So if you have a young PI that's still, or a new PI, I should say, that hasn't yet had many postdocs successfully move through the lab, publish a lot, get hired somewhere, get a co-mentor or, or a mentoring committee member who has um, that can bring that maturity and experience. That's what they're also looking for. That's what I had to do, and I also had to really flesh out the role of the co-mentor. Because my first application said, oh, I have a co-sponsor, you know, this Mr. Famous guy that these people would know who he was because he's trained a lot of postdocs and they've all gone on to have their own labs. But I didn't say enough, what are we actually going to do together? How is he going to mentor me? How is he going to enrich my experience? So with my reapplication, that's when I had to really flesh that out and I think that was really important for getting me on the second time. I had a follow-up actually specifically to that in terms of your perspective, all things being equal in terms of the fame of a, a particular PI, of letters of support as opposed to like a collaborative co-mentor type of letter, which is, so in mine I focused on just having a bunch of support letters saying that I had these resources and that PI would be happy to help me if I needed them, because it seemed like a lot of work to try to navigate having a co-mentor mm -hmm. that you're doing all this collaborative stuff with and writing up a separate schedule for them. So I don't know if you have any particular insight on that in terms of a, a, a debate that you have of your own figuring out that they were going to be a collaborator or a supporter? I think in my personal case it was because my PI was junior faculty and he hadn't even had a grad student leave the lab yet. So I had to have a co-sponsor. But I, I mean, like you said, like if you have collaborators, obviously when you get letters from them, I think it'll depend on your situation and whether you really need that, that mentoring support which you'll have to write up as a co-sponsor. So for people who haven't gone through the process yet, a co-mentor, is or a co-sponsor, I guess, would be the, the yeah. word they use. That this person has to submit their bio sketch, and they have to submit you know, a list of, of their existing funding. And, uh, you can also have like a mentoring committee, which are just random people that are going to write a letter that says, so-and-so is an extraordinary postdoc, and we worked on this together, and we're going to do this, and she'll fly out and visit my lab, and I'll teach her how to dissect yada yada. And like, but but it's a much more informal kind of mode of confidence in your ability to carry out the project. It's a lot less work for the person you're asking for the help from, um, and so that might be something that if you're not ready to, if you don't have the kind of relationship that lets this person be a co-sponsor for you, a letter of support might be might be more feasible. And I think still carries weight with the committee because while the submission process really cares about if you're a mentor, if you're a sponsor or if you're a supporter or if you're a reference writer, I think the people reading the application are just like, oh, this is a colleague I know and respect. They're saying good things about this person. And so I think you get a lot of bang for your buck out of having that sort of advising committee instead of a formal co-sponsor. Unless there's a deficiency, like a lack of a training record that really requires having another person in that role. Yeah, my, my co-mentor was just simply for practical reasons. Like a lot of the experiments that I had to do had to be in that person's lab uh, for radioactive reasons. So, <laughs> so I also had a co-mentor. I will say it wasn't that much work to, because anyone who's applying to grants routinely will have a bio sketch and will have the list of funding. And actually, what I did to have the co-mentor scenario is have a single. Um, letter drafted between the two of them and then they wrote in there that they collaboratively wrote the letter and then they both signed it. So it wasn't too much work and every reviewer did mention that it was a strength that I had a co-mentor in an area that was different than the primary mentor. So I think you can use that to your advantage without too much work and if you can find a way to do that it's probably a plus.
letter of support, I had one of those as well, but um, that wasn't emphasized as much in the review, so I don't, that's just my impression of it. So um, you touched on how can you identify which institutes are the most likely to support you? Is it just like if your PI has already gotten funding from that institute, or are there can you branch out from that? I think you probably can branch out from that, but I think probably the easiest place to start is where your PI has got funding and kind of. So that was all of your experiences? And I think you can look at um, NIH Reporter if you have, because some of, if you're like in immunology and cancer like I was, you can apply to a couple of institutes, but I went with what my mentor got most of his grants from, and then also you can look at the description of the um, institute's scope, and that can help as well, as well as NIH Reporter for F32s to see what's being funded in your area. And that also raises the, the point that there is going to be there are going to be areas, um, areas of focus, areas of um, scope. scope. So, so basically, if you if you go diving deep into the NIH websites for all of these different institutes, they're going to talk about you know particular areas of concern where they're looking to make progress or train more people. Um, initiatives, something or another. That I should have looked this up ahead of time, but I'm just thinking of it now just use the exact words that they say. Like, because of NIGMS's focus on basic cellular and organismal biology with <laughs> potential relevance towards human disease. You know, it's just so you spoon feed it to them. As uh, sorry, Chris was saying earlier, you really want to know these are tired people that are reading a huge stack of applications. Just give them exactly, like, does it check off our oh, institutional mission? That's a, Oh, yeah, okay, she used the exact words that were put on the website and checked. Like, if you just really want to give it to them and make it easy for them to, to say, oh, this is, why did you fund this person? Because she said she was going to do the stuff that we say on, on the website that we want to do. You just make it easy. Yeah, a, a testament to that is in my review, I was looking back at it for this, and they copied and pasted a lot of the things I had written in my grant for the weaknesses or, or strengths, excuse me. Uh, they just copy and paste and stuff. So I think for them it makes it a lot easier if they can just copy paste for your review. They're going to have a favorable uh, impression of your application. So um, is there any way to find out who your review committee is? Or is that? After you submit, they will, there's a list of the study section that's going to see it or has seen it. I forget if I saw it ahead of time or right after the fact. But you are, like, ironclad rules prevent you from ever talking to any of these people about it ever. Like, you might know they reviewed it, they might know they reviewed it, but you may not discuss it at all. So. How about the program officer? How closely did you work with your program officers, like, before, during, after submission? I haven't had any direct communication. I only communicated with him because I didn't know whether I should reapply or not, but I got the sense that she was very eager to talk and I probably could have communicated with them more. I don't think you're pestering them, I think they enjoy doing this, so if you have any questions, I would reach out to them. Did any, did any of you use a program officer initially, like by sending out your specifics aim page to help get placed somewhere? Did any of you use that strategy? I did reach out ahead of time for my K99, but not for the other. Yeah, not to get placed anywhere, but, but my, like, so I would say, like, one thing that I would do everyone uh, is get to know your program officer. Uh, they're probably going to the meetings that you're going to, um, and you can set up meetings at a, at a conference with them. Um, that's been my experience. Uh, and our program officer is fantastic. Uh, he's a really nice guy, and he always says, like, it's never too early to send me a specific game stage. Uh, so I definitely sent him my specific game stage before, got his feedback, tried to incorporate it. Um, you know, they're not allowed to speak in the review room, but they're sitting in the review room. Uh, so they can ultimately give you feedback on what was said about your application, but they can't like, like if you talk to them about like, for example, in my case, like all my radioactive training, um, and in the review room they're like, he, doesn't have this, uh, he can't actually say anything about that. Um, 
but they're super valuable. Like I can't stress enough how valuable having knowing them and having a, a relationship with them is. And some are easier to talk to than others. Um, I <laughs> I think my program officer recently pretended to be his own secretary. When they're calling him. <laughs> is this Dr. Sansa? This is his office. <laughs> Maybe we could just put that in an email to him and he will answer it. <laughs> So some, some are going to be a little bit uh, more friendly than others, but I think all of them are, are eager to help. Like they, it's their job, right? So they they want to make it work, and um, I think don't don't be afraid. I don't think there's anything you can ask them that's going to hurt your application. Uh, so just go ahead and, and put it out there. Yeah, the end. Sorry. No, it's okay. I was just going to say they'll send you an email out right after you submit as well, and you can. Um, kind of interpret from the language they use, whether they're wanting to receive your call or email if you're deciding on a contact. Yeah, I'd just say, like, uh, just a, as a testament to their power, um, so they ultimately make the funding decisions, right? So the review panel will make recommendations to your institute for, for me and IEHS. But then NIEHS will meet and decide where their funding line is, but which specific grants are going to get funded. And in some cases, that may mean that some borderline grants that are right within their funding line may get skipped for something right over the funding line if they feel that they want to fund that grant. Uh, and that may be because they have two of on the same topic and they want to diversify. It may be because We've been talking to them about that project, and they're really excited about it because you're really excited about it. So it can it can really make the difference between a borderline grant actually getting funded. So talk to them. Chris, you just brought up um, scoring method. Can can y'all talk a little bit about that? Is that like five domains, right? And on each of them, you could get scored from a one to a nine, and one is excellent and nine is poor. And so your, but each of those five domains is not going to be rated equally. So each of your three reviewers will give you, right, so like your institution, if you're a Duke, it's gonna be a one or a two. It's a fantastic place to be doing pretty much any kind of science. So that's gonna be a really high score. But that's not gonna maybe count as much as your, your mentorship and training plan or your research plan that are more candidate specific. Um, and so, so each reviewer will give you an overall impact score. And apparently during the meeting, the panel, you know, you bring this up to discuss and maybe you've got a two, a three, and a three. And so they'll ask the room, you know, is anybody voting, you know, they'll have a discussion, is anybody voting out of range? That means anybody giving a one or something worse than a three. And if anybody says, yes, I want to give her a five because I actually think, like, I'm a specialist in this area of research, and I think this is a really poor grant for such and such reason, then maybe people, okay, we're going to, the room score will end up being a little bit lower. For the most part, if the people that spent the most time on your application are giving you twos and threes, they'll probably end up somewhere with a two and a three. And then they multiply that by ten, <laughs> and then that's your impact score. And so impact scores that are really excellent will be in the teens. Um, and twin and like low twenties, good impact scores will be like I'd say the cutoff. I think in my domain in my year was maybe a 23, 24, 25. So like mid twenties, you're you still got a shot. <coughs> By the low thirties, you're probably not going to be funded on this application cycle, but you'll be able to improve it. And then I think anything if you're if you're in the bottom half of the room, you won't get the numerical score. You're talking about percentile. The, percent the percentile. Well, the percentile. Well, no, impact score. No, impact score is. Um, impact scores. Or the, I don't. It could be institute differences, yeah. but at NCI you get the impact score, and then the impact score is used to determine. Since there's multiple study sections, they have to adjust between, you know, people being crazy in one. So they'll take all those impact scores and adjust it for each study section, and then apply a percentile for the entire F32 cohort for that institute. And the percentile score is what matters for NCI for funding, which is what you said. So those values sound. Sure. If you're 25 percent or below that got funded at NCI last year, for example, the impact score is just how they determine that. But where they get the impact score from, it's way more. Is this it's, sort of discussion yeah, process? Yeah. So I'm trying to. The year. My impact score was like a 
21, but the percentile is in the teens. And I think that the... That's uh, how you compared to everyone else. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Saying, everyone kind of seems also did okay, then you did really good compared to everybody yeah. else. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, indirectly, the percentile yeah. is determined through that discussion. It's just one step removed, at least it didn't seem like. Right, right. Um, but sure. the, so, I think what they said was, uh, I tried to find this because actually I didn't know until I was looking for this, this uh, discussion. And I think it's basically the likelihood that the project, what they said in all of the reviews I noticed was, or the summary, was that the, the key determinant was the likelihood of the project leading to you becoming an independent investigator, essentially. So that seemed to be, that summarizes basically all the criteria. And it's based on this discussion that they have. Yes. So, for example, they might make a comment that, oh, there were some methodological shortcomings in the research program, but, you know, he's in a good lab, the PI has an excellent track record, and he published good papers during his graduate, during his graduate study, so it's going to be fine. You know, they're, they're never going to, they're not going to, nobody's going to submit a flawless application. Um, but there are some weaknesses that will sink it in some, some way. But you're right that the, the, the exact, Cutoffs are going to vary from institute to institute year to year, um, and the program officer is the best person to give you feedback about how well you fared in that particular year. And usually they'll say it by saying something like, "Why don't you hold off on your submission for now?" And so even if you don't have plans to imminently resubmit in that next cycle, writing to them and being like, "Oh, gee, I sure was glad to see that my score, my grant was scored decently well. I look forward to improving it. I'm going to resubmit." They'll be like, "Yeah, hold your horses until we make the decision." And that's a good sign. Um, and you can find online the pay lines for previous years, dating back to, to early 2000s. And what I found was for NCI, those percentile, percentiles that they give you were pretty consistent. So I think, if I remember correctly, 25% is pretty much every year before. It fluctuates by a few percentage, but if you have like a 20 percentile grant, it'll get funded, unless something crazy happens. <clears throat> so can I ask a follow-up to what you said about um, the likelihood that that project will lead to you becoming an independent investigator? So well, and the training plan, right? Just, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So are all of your current projects in line with exactly what you want to do? Like you're going to kind of do an offshoot of that? Like if you want to go on and use your own lab, or are you in a different situation where you're learning a new technique or a new way of thinking to bring back to like the field that you want to focus on? To me, that question is um, is more for the K99 because right now well, your F32, except for very very long term future, like someday I will be a research professor at R1 University. Like there's there's no there's no future plans for your independent career that's part of the F32. You just say like I plan to to take you know be a professor at a small liberal arts school and have a little research lab versus I want to do research at a major research institute. But other than that, there's nothing in this F32 application about your future. So I would say that my the, the paper that I'm wrapping up in Dave's lab right now ultimately is fulfilling some of the aims of that F32. Some of them turned out to be like, oh, we tested it and now, and now we're going to move in a different direction. Um, but it's not so much not so much like a long-term research plan. For your K99, it's more important that you have, here's a little chunk of it that I'm going to finish while I'm in my advisor's lab still, but I'm going to break away from what my advisor does. She works on X, and I'm going to take this in this brand new direction and combine it with my previous experience or my existing side project collaborating with so-and-so and do this whole new thing. And so that's a much bigger part of the K99. Yeah, so I'd say that it was definitely part of the F for me. Um, so my program officer recommended that I have that language in there. Uh, like how, so for me it was, um, <clears throat> you know, my degree is in biology, um, and it was getting the additional training in chemistry. Um, so, you know, very different skill set. Um, and so he wanted explicit language in there saying, like, this is how I'm going to tie this back to what I do and move forward as a career. Um, so, yeah, as closely as you can, kind of showing how that's going to help you move forward, I think, is beneficial. 
But I think generally they're optimistic about people who are learning new techniques. Like, well, that was a criticism for mine, is they said that you're not really branching out technically. So if you are learning a lot of new things, highlight that. And it's very nice if you can bridge it from your, your doctoral experience and say, here's how these two things together will make me a unique researcher who will contribute to the field. And I think that's a plus for sure. And you have to explain why you're changing, your, you know, because as I said earlier, you have to do something that's sufficiently different from what you've already done as a, as a grad student. But explaining why you've taken this, this leap into a new area requires some contextualization too. I kind of had a similar situation with you, Casey, that I studied mice for my PhD and I'm using mice again here. But what I, the way I wrote that story was that I studied physiology as a grad student and I'm studying anatomy, so being able to combine two different complementary areas is something that they view as a strength, and it's something that you can, you can say you can use future in your future lab. I think I have a couple lines saying, I know we use this. Yeah. Yeah. There's a document, it's been so long, but there's, I printed off some of this. There's a document where you talk about your doctoral dissertation research experience, and then you move into your postdoc, and you can talk about all of that. If you just focus on uh, explaining rationale for everything and how it makes you more likely to transition to the next stage, that's what they're looking for. At least my impression. Yes. Uh, how how many uh, months did it take you each to put together your application? For me, I think it was around two months, but I had been applying to grants before that which I would recommend doing, applying to other grants, because obviously this isn't the only one. Um, so I had some of the components prepared in advance, but two months-ish. Yeah, I, I think that it depends if you have, if you have any material that you're starting with, and it can either be research plans that you've put together for a previous grant application, or, you know, so there are, there are many documents that you'll need to submit, and it's really helpful to just make sure you have a, a, a comprehensive checklist of what you're going to need to upload because you don't want to be sitting there, you know, the week that this is due, like, oh, I don't have a facilities document. And the facilities are sort of like, the lab is this many hundred square feet and we have a PCR machine and we have microscopes and we have stools in front of the microscopes. And it's <laughs> but your PI will have something like this that he needs to submit for his grant. And so there's a lot of unavoidable plagiarism when it comes to this stuff, because a list of, of lab equipment is a list of lab equipment, but it's completely kosher. And, and I just, because of like a, a background working in the writing tutoring center, I was like prepared in collaboration with Dr. David Sherman because I, I couldn't just put my name on the thing that he sent me. But, but you can reuse this sort of stuff. So there's a lot of that stuff already sitting out there on somebody's hard drive that would be useful for you with a few tweaks um, to make it your own. So that sort of, it's really mostly the research plan and putting together a training plan that doesn't sound too much like an afterthought. Um, and that, and I think that that's something for all of these, for this and the K99, the, the training is, is as important as the research. Um, and the research, because they're ultimately funding you and they're not funding the research the same way that like an R01 funds particular research questions, you're, you can make you can be wrong about things in your research plan. You can have you can have things in there that people will disagree with or think won't work, and it won't sink your chances. But if you don't have a plan for like I'm going to take this course in the summer and I'm going to attend these four meetings and I'm going to go you know work with my collaborator over at UNC on Mondays and Thursdays and he's going to show me how to use this device. Like you need that side of it to show that you are going to benefit from the NIH investing in your. Uh, and so I think that, that thinking ahead about that sort of thing is as important as thinking ahead about the project. A couple months? <laughs> the rate limiting step is the uh, training plan and getting the sponsor to write the letter if you have a busy PI. <coughs> so obviously you need to new, know the research plan for the training plan because those are integrated. But what I would start on, I would start on the grant application portions as soon as possible so that you can get the sponsor's letter finalized if you have a busy PI. That's going to be your time limit. Yeah, I'd say about three months probably would be realistic your first time. Um, I try to do it in, I think, about a month. Because, like, my first month was kind of just, like, settling in and researching my new topic and then, like, figuring out, yeah. Uh, so probably about a month, and I felt very rushed. Uh, and I'd say, yeah, don't, yeah, don't discount the fact that there are a ton of documents that you need to produce for this thing. 
um, and a lot of them are small and short um, and really not hard, technically hard to write, but they all add time. Um, and so the first time you're writing them, maybe if you reapply, you really don't have to change them much, and you can just kind of move them into the completing folder or whatever, but um, the first time around, it's going to take some time. Um, so yeah, I would say definitely, definitely give yourself the opportunity. And I'd say start um, what someone else said. Start by just making a list of all the documents that you need to, to upload and how long they need to be. Um, and then the other thing that I'd say that, that uh, got me on my resubmission was I wasn't checking for updates um, of the, the funding announcement. So um, I was just working off of the list that I had from my first application thinking that two cycles later it's not going to be different. Um, and it was. Um, <laughs> so here I was, like the last couple days, trying to upload documents, and like I didn't have one of the documents. Um, and like two of the others had like merged into one, but uh, I couldn't just merge them because the the length changed. So like I had to do some frantic last minute work to like write one new one and combine some others. So like yeah, just make sure you're up to date. <laughs> yeah, that's another thing is you want to be familiar with. The uploading process because I tried to submit mine really early too and it was really frantic and I ended up just not submitting it because I'm like this is not ready and it was really down to the wire so I think that was actually good because it gave me more time to think and rewrite some portions of the grant but sometimes some things are a little confusing when you get on there. <laughs> this is important for anybody who will be submitting their first grant. You, Duke has internal deadlines so you might be thinking you know uh, February 15th is the day I'm going to submit my grant. But Duke is going to need, I think it's two full business weeks mm -hmm. before yeah. the deadline. You're going to have to have given them at least your specific aims page, maybe your project summary, your project narrative. I, there are a million little things like this, all of these tiny documents with different names. They're going to need some, some com and maybe the budget, they're, they're going to need some components of this way ahead of time. And you need to know who is your departmental grants person that's going to need to receive this from you. And they're going to pass it off to get signatures from somebody in, in the grants office, and then it can be uploaded. They will also create for you a submission page at grants.duke. That's an excellent checklist of everything you need, because there's nothing, you can't submit anything besides what's on that list. And everything on that list, you're going to want to make sure, if it's sort of like responsible use of animals, and you're like, well, that doesn't apply to me because I only study cells and culture. Like that's, you, just, you just have to say, you know, not applicable. I think for my F32, I might have even uploaded Word documents saved as PDFs that were like, responsible use of animals, not applicable. <laughs> so this is something, but it just helps you to see it all in one place. So start that process early with the grants office. The page limits are, like the due dates are on NIH standard dates slash backslash whatever your institute is, dot HTML. And then page limits are nih.yourinstitute backslash questions backslash dates backslash standards dates backslash AIDS dates may not apply. Like it's just it's ridiculous. <laughs> but these, so you'll have like 27 tabs open <coughs> that you will just close triumphantly the day that you submit this thing. <laughs> so there's the ERA Commons app, which is where your, where your application will go after the person at grants.duke okays it to be zapped over there, but you can't submit it directly to ERA Commons, but you need to check to make sure it gets there after you push the button to do. This is another thing. Look at the FOA, that's the Funding Opportunity Announcement. That's the thing that gets updated from cycle to cycle. So the first time you're going to go in, you're going to type NIGMS F32, and you might see the 2014 NIGMS F32 FOA. Make sure you're looking at the current one, because that's going to have all of the updated information. The SF SR24424, do you know the thing I'm talking about? There's like a giant NIH instruction manual. That has, so the, the funding opportunity announcement will say things like, you only need a sponsor in your, in your area of expertise. You're only eligible until the such and such date after your defense date or after you started your postdoc. There will be a, there's a whole separate document that tells you what are the parts, what has to go into the various parts of this application. And so that's this SR, do you know the one I'm talking about? I know. Yeah, it's SF424. SF424, 24, 24, like 24, yeah. 24. So you'll, you'll find this thing. And that's just this giant manual that explains and again, make sure you're looking at the most updated version, what has to go in each section. 
And so one thing that changed in the time between when the last member of our lab submitted and I submitted was this, um, it's called the impact, the innovation, and what's the other thing? Do you know what I'm trying to, there, there's now like these three domains that they're scoring you for. And one might think, well, you know, you're a smart person with a PhD and you're a critical reader, you're going to read this and say, oh, here's how I would summarize what the innovation is, or significance, innovation, and something of this person's, of this person's grant. But no, you should have a section with like capital letters in bold that says significance, and then you'll write the significance of my project is, and, and you, you really, and you then look at that SR, SF24 or 424, and you say, what do they want the significance to be? And then you like spoon feed your project into that language into the, your reviewer. And then the same for impact or innovation. What's the third section? Uh, significance, innovation, strategy. innovation, and something. Maybe strategy. I think it's research strategy. And so you're going to say the same things over and over again in your in your writing, and it's going to drive you crazy. But just remember, they're only going to page through that. Like, who knows which section they're going to start with? You need to make sure that wherever they start reading this, you give them all the little bits they need to move forward. And so, so you'll find this somewhere in the updated version of the manual of the FOA that tells you all the little details that have to go into each section. And it's ridiculous that in 2018 this can't be one single hyperlinkable document, but it's not. And so you'll have your 25 tabs open and you'll just have to, okay, so page length, got it, I don't need to look at that anymore. The dates, I know, I don't need to look at that anymore. But keep that manual open and just refer to it frequently because it'll tell you what you need to know. When you were preparing to write, um, what sort of writing training did you do in terms of like attending the GOPEN or the School of Medicine's um, F32 writing seminar that they do, um, or the F32 that um, Molly posts? Did you do any of that type of stuff or internal writing training within your lab, or did you depend on departmental historical knowledge of F32 submissions? I looked at some successful applications from previous lab members or friends of mine. But no formal training? I, mean. I think I, I went to this. Yeah, I went to this too. Okay. Yeah. But no one went to the School of Medicine or the like, Open before? Yeah. I wasn't aware of it. No, I went to the, the right wing grants workshop, mm -hmm. um, but that was kind of late in my process, I think. I think I was like maybe a couple weeks out from resubmitting, uh, and it was super helpful. Um, but I think like, yeah, one of, I think it only depressed me because, because um, I was like, I don't have time to make all these changes, one. Uh, and I think their other big like piece of advice was like, if your grant was triaged the first time, so like when it goes in for scoring, like if it's scored in the bottom half, um, they were like, don't bother resubmitting it. Uh, and I'm like, that was me. Like, why am I, why am I even doing this? Um, and it got funded the second time, so I'm like, oh, good that I didn't listen. Because um, you got your redirective shield. Right. Yeah. <laughs> That's an important thing to note. The people who get your revised application are probably not the same people who reviewed it the first time. Like, yeah. In fact, I think they're definitely not. So it's a completely new ballgame when you resubmit. Yeah. Yeah, and you, and you have, right. So on the resubmission, you get the one page kind of cover letter to say, like, these were the main critiques the last time. Here's why they were wrong. Or, you know, in a nice way, of course. Uh, like you would, you know, responding to a reviewer comments, right, on a manuscript. Uh, like, we thank you for this excellent comment, but, um, yeah, so, uh, you can you can spell out things much more explicitly there. Um, as Casey, just a final point for me, as Casey was saying, that if you get a successful application that seemed to be, that helped me the most, is having something to look at, just, Keep in mind that there's updates in the way you need to do things if it's an older application. If you're looking for applications, if you're not able to get one from somebody online, if the NIH has examples of every different type of grant, I think at least NIH ID has it. You should be able to find it with Google. I don't know the address off the top of my head, but uh, if you find an, an example of a successful application, that helps a lot with building out everything. And you can find all the, well, all the recipients ever of NIH of F32s at um, NIH reporter, so you can like narrow it down by Duke, by institute, or whatever. And I mean, would you guys be willing to share your whole grant, or are you like, oh, I'll show you the RCR, but not the. One thing, I just sent oh. somebody that's applying for the K99 a screenshot of my final upload folder. So that was sort of the checklist, right? Here are all the documents that I prepared in you know, those 
final PDFs, and I think that that was a helpful, yeah, I, I, she wanted to see, I don't know, my mentor plan, and I said that too, but just in terms of what do I actually need to do, it's nice to see the final, the final list of somebody, that somebody had. So regarding to the proposal, say, yeah, uh, when I joined the lab, my advisor asked me to work on R1, and uh, so how likely, so when I'm going to write a proposal for that, say we have 32. So if, uh, so I mean, what's the relation between the two? Bill, my, my uh, advice already found uh, uh, an R1, uh, uh, right? And then how likely they're going to find me if I write uh, something similar or I should uh, make something different? That's, That's actually a strength that your research is funded already for this. I mean, and for our, yeah, yeah this if you have an oral <coughs> directly related to this, I mean, it's clear that the research you want to do is funded. Then what I would do is try to make sure that in the sponsor letter is clear that you contributed in a major way to the R01, and that those were in part original ideas, or if, if they were, those were in part original ideas to you, so that they don't think you're just copying and pasting from your PIs. You'll have to make that really clear, though. Uh, so you need to yeah, make it clear. Yeah, I think it, one of the things they look for is to make sure that you're thinking on your own and you're not just taking from your PI, whatever they have going on. So that might be a concern with the R1. I mean, there's a plus of the R1 that your research is funded, and that's one of the things they look at. So the research you want to do is definitely funded. That's good. Um, then you say, uh, here's, here's what I contributed to the R01. These were my ideas. And if the sponsor says that in the letter, mm -hmm. then I think that should be viewed as a strength and not a that was actually one of the critiques that I had was someone said, well, this sounds kind of like your sponsor's R01, ah. but they, it was incorrect, so I had to point out nicely in my cover letter on the, the return that it's completely different. But that was something that they said, like, you can't be overlapping with the projects. It has to be your own project. The NIH is very strict about no double <coughs> right? Mm -hmm. And so you need, if you're going to submit two different grants to, in two different cycles or to do two different funding agencies, none of the aims can be the same because they're not going to fund the same work twice. Now, that said, the F32 is not going to fund any research. It's going to pay your salary plus your health insurance plus like a box of PCR tubes. It's not that much money, <laughs> right? And so, so it's fine for the project to be funded by the NIH, but you have to show that what you're going to do, you're not just going to you're not like hired on that grant to finish. You're, you're now going to build from it. And so maybe there can be some preliminary data. And you and I think that being open about it and directly saying, like this, you know, this was funded by an F32 or by an R01 to my advisor. And and be directive with your, your PI nicely, but say, like, I would like you to cover these, like in your letter, I'd like you to talk about how, you know, I've been here for six months, but in those first six months I you know, have already accomplished X, Y, and Z, even though it's not published yet. Like, I want you to, I want you to, they're going to be worried that I don't have a publication. I want you to tell them that. You know, just, just tell them what you want them to know that you can't necessarily say about yourself. And your PI wants you to get this. They don't want to keep paying you from their grant, so they're going to be happy to help. Yeah. Um, and so anything like, please please tell them how, how much I worked on this grant with you and how help, how helpful I was and what good ideas I added to it. That'll all, that'll all be in your favor. And to make it back on that, don't, just let your PI write the sponsor letter. I would give them a list of things that need to be said and then to make it cohesive with your training plan and your research plan and make it clear that you're successful already and that you're going to be successful. I mean, they could just, I had to write my own sponsor letter, honestly, because my PI was too busy, but I actually viewed that as kind of a plus because I could make it, it was, it was linked with every other document. So make sure that happens with your PI. Don't let them just craft whatever they, Okay. Be helpful. And you. if they've done this before, they might think of things that you hadn't thought about. So, for example, my PI, when I looked at the first thing of the sponsor, the first version of the sponsor letter, he said, I'll invite Casey to guest lecture in my cell biology class. And I thought, oh, that's, that's a nice training experience that I wouldn't have necessarily thought to put in there. And so they'll have some experience and some thoughts with things that the NIH likes to see. Um, and they'll help you, help you get there. But definitely don't be afraid to tell them, here's what I, here's what I need you to say about me. Yeah, I think that's an important point that like this isn't funding your research, right? It's just funding your your uh, you know, salary, right? Sorry. <laughs> um, so like they're expecting you to be funded off of a grant for the research funds, 
So I think, like I explicitly said, like this is funded, like the research is going to be funded off of this grant. Um, and so your PI should be supportive of taking some of the funding that was presumably paying for your salary that is now being covered by the F32 and doing some additional experiments in a, in a related but distinct area. Um, I mean, it can't be completely unrelated um, because, you know, they wouldn't allow that, but um, it should be a distinct area from the grant itself, yeah. And I would like to cover, um, this is the second year or possibly the third year that people have mentioned getting dinged on the RCR plan, which was possibly a harbinger of things to come. So can you talk about what you put in your RCR plan? So I know I specifically talked about um, every level of RCR training I had. So like I had to have it in grad school, um, so I talked about the level of training and the format of it. So like they'll be very specific with you. They want to know uh, how many hours you've gotten, what the format of your RCR training was, what topics you covered. Like they have a list of maybe five things, three to five things, I don't know. Um, and you want to make sure that at every level of training, because one of the big things is they want this to be a career long thing for you. Um, so I started talking about my training in grad school. Uh, I talked about the you know, the day-long training when you start your postdoc. Uh, that you all should have done last week. you all should have done last week. Or, right. yeah. Right. Um, and then I talked about the recurring RCR training throughout your postdoc that you're supposed to be doing. But no one actually ever seems to check on that, um, to the best of my knowledge. But you, you should be doing it. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, uh, and anything further that you have planned beyond that. Um, so just spelling it all out for a document. And then I would say, like my case, be very explicit. Say like, say, you know, this particular part meets the NIH uh, requirements ex very explicitly. And say like anything beyond that, I'm exceeding those requirements. Like make it very easy for them to know that, that you're doing everything you need to be doing. I think detail is really important. And in my document, I talked about the formal training, which was the day-long training. Mm -hmm. and the refresher courses that you do annually, but also informal training, which could be, you know, during lab meetings, your PI makes it a priority that people talk about issues that are related to RCR, maybe things that haven't been discussed yet in the RCR series. So just get into a lot of detail. Mine's about three quarters of a page long. Yeah, so for mine, I had sections of four, it tells you, I think, in the instructions what sections you need, but you cover the format of the training, the specific subject matter, so what topics are included, like research misconduct, ethics, mentor and trainee responsibilities, and then the roles of mentors in the, in the um, training. So you talk about how mentors are going to ensure that you're being ethical in your research. So for an example, I do a lot of tumor measurements, so they said that they would provide a tech to make sure those were provided. Um, duration of instruction and frequency of instruction, and as long as you're very specific and thorough, I don't think you should have any issues. Just make sure you do enough hours of training. I don't know what the limit is. Mine was 18.5 is how many I proposed to do, but throughout the course, I don't know how many we're supposed to. But just make sure you meet that. Minimum. Outside of the clinical domain, I don't think it was as, as prescriptive, but it certainly like I just, I think I searched my email for Molly's email about RCR training, where she was like, the topics we will cover are here. The format is a day-long seminar. As always, if in doubt, consult Molly's email. Um, so it's all, it's all there. Yes. It, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to shift gears a little bit and kind of ask, after you got your award, how did you navigate the that change over being a postdoctoral associate to a postdoctoral scholar and kind of the repercussions of being in this weird gray zone of student, not student, employee, not employee, and how that affects kind of physical and, and personal life things. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't hit a tax. Um, I haven't done my taxes yet. So I'm probably not going to answer that. So, so no to explain a little bit or expand upon this question, one of the problems that happens once you become an F32 scholar is that you're no longer a Duke employee, technically. And so the, the main concern about this is that your benefits will change. You still will be eligible for Duke's employee-provided health care, but now, technically, your institutional allowance that the NIH, so your NIH pays your salary that's set, you know, they, it's 
you can find it on the website. I think the first year, this year, we used 49,000 something. Mm -hmm. But you'll also have this additional 9,000 or so institutional allowance that can first be used to cover your health insurance before you go buy your box of PCR tubes. You have to get dibs on it for your health insurance. When your gross taxable income is reported to the IRS, they will think that the amount that was paid for your health insurance is part of that taxable gross. So far, and it's been a couple years, I think actually it's been three tax seasons that I've had this because of when I activated relative to the, to the fiscal year. I just sent an email, or sent a letter along with my taxes saying, this employer-provided health care was, was mistakenly included in my taxable gross. Like, look, the website says what my, what my salary is. And so far the IRS has not flagged this and we didn't pay taxes on it, but your mileage may vary. You might get audited. It's a weird thing. They're going to think that you should be paying self-employment tax because you're not employed by Duke and yet you're getting paid for something and they don't understand what it is that you're getting paid for. You won't have a W-2. Uh, your taxes won't automatically be uh, withheld from payroll. So you have to pay estimated tax. It's a, it's a bit of a pain in the butt. But so far, just by trying to explain things, um, I've managed not to have any major penalty. And let me point out that this is not because of me and old Duke. NIH specifically says that institutions may not treat recipients of F-32s or T-32s as employees. So this puts every institution in a pickle. Like, I've been going to postdoc meetings now for uh, 12 years, and this is like the signature issue. So institutions jump through all kinds of different hoops to try to address this. At UNC, postdocs are not allowed to be on employee health insurance. They're on an entirely separate plan. Um, some institutions are like Duke, where we have a weird workaround where you can still get employee health insurance even though you're not an employee. That's also WashU, Yale. So anyway, yeah, it's it's because NIH says you can't be employees. IRS says, well, why are you getting employee health insurance then? They should be paying taxes on it. Oh, and as a disclaimer, this is not tax advice. <laughs> I, would, I would call HR and, and talk to your business people as much as possible because I found my department doesn't have so many of these F-32, so I had to teach them how to apply the institutional allowance to insurance. They didn't know that they were supposed to do that. And just make sure re, make sure to read the information on postdoc services, contact Molly if you have questions. Thank you. It's like question seven, which is like this long. Yeah. And do not assume that your business person knows how to do this or the HR will take care of it by themselves. Uh, other benefits that change if you have pre tax income withheld for child care or for health savings account, that benefit goes away. So if it's possible, if your partner is able to change their withholding to have that withheld, again, technically they might say that you're, you know, as, um, since you don't have W-2 income, you might not, you might get some pushback for having it withheld from your, from your partner's salary, because in order to do some of this stuff, you both have to be employed with W-2 income. Again, not tax advice, but so far I've just written an explanatory letter and it's been okay. But so if you're the one that has that money with health, you might have to switch. Um, and no one is going to write you a letter and tell you you have to send estimated tax payments now. So you just have to know that you, do, you must do that, um, or else you're going to pay a penalty at tax time. Yeah, I'd say that varies too. Um, so like. The Nicholas School was pretty new to these awards when I got by, and they were kind of trying to figure out what they were doing. Um, um, but, uh, yeah, so estimated tax payments, uh, they, they are allowed to take your taxes out of your, your payments. Uh, so if you force the issue with them, they will do that, and you will not have to have the tax payments. Um, so it was a discussion with them, um, and we had to blame one, to be sure, but um, yeah, they would hold my taxes now uh, for me, uh, and I don't have to worry about that aspect of it. Mine yeah. as well, yeah. I think if you contact Duke HR, they'll do it if you push them on it. Yeah. Uh, the other like super annoying thing to me was that I used to do gym. Um, and you're no longer an employee, so uh, that relationship changes. So like, there, I'm sure there's a lot of little things like that. Um, for me, like, it became the employee rate uh, auto billed to me every month. Bef 
before I got the F-32 to the uh, not employee rate billed annually, uh, all in one lump sum in person at their office. And I'm like, I can't pay for that up front. <laughs> like, <laughs> There's some for that too, where they couldn't take it out of my account because I'm not getting a check for Duke directly. Okay. It's also private for parking. Parking. Yeah. Yep. So you'll get an email that's just sort of like we're canceling your parking pass, and you'll freak out because you go over there. No, that's covered. So the gym thing I didn't know about, but the, the parking is covered in the FAQ. I thought you knew about that. Yeah. Yeah. And actually, follow the FAQ advice that I applaud you. Thank you for warning me about that. I emailed I think Jeffrey Fisher's name, and he responded right away. And I actually didn't have that nasty gram come through because I knew from the FAQ on the website ahead of time. And he was actually really happy that I contacted him. Before the rollover happens, so that you could fix it preemptively. Yeah, nobody likes to email that. <laughs> yeah. So thank you. Yeah. So that was <laughs> yeah, and and if any of you like, if, if you have, because um, Michael made a good point. If your business manager isn't experienced, please contact me. I can put you in touch with a business or an HR manager who is experienced, like Jason Howard and MGM is really great at this stuff. So somebody who can help watch your business manager through the whole process. Like yeah. all the things that may or may not happen. I have a follow-up question to that actually. Mm -hmm. Jason Howard is actually through HR recommends that I talk to, but he's not part of my department. So is he an unofficial channel or is he kind of like an no. official channel that I could actually do? Yeah, no, you can reach out to him. No, it's just he's an HR manager and he's just really helpful and very knowledgeable. So it's just a good person to ask. Like just like you know, you might go across the hall and ask him. So yeah, it's totally fine to reach out to him. Okay. And if he's too busy, he'll just tell you something. People no, have also good. recently had problems applying to a mortgage. And so that's just another thing to know that this is a weird type of income that mortgage lenders are not going to be used to dealing with. And there's somebody at Duke. Well, and that was actually because it was also a concern for graduate for students. students. So Duke had already taken care of that and went to the Duke Credit Union. Yes. And so the Duke Credit <laughs> Union knows about this and they're like, oh, okay. That'll be okay. So, so yeah. If you're, if you're interested, it'll impact your ability to shop around, but you'll be able to hopefully get some help from so I also I purchased a house while I was on the F-32 and it was like a little nightmare. Um, and they were like, you are not an employee of anyone. We are not giving you a loan. <laughs> um, but ultimately, they ended up having a couple forms that uh, like they sent to my advisor and she just had to sign her life away that I was her employee and like she was going to continue paying me. And she, she's super helpful, so she was willing to do that. But um, it was definitely a somewhat blocked thing. It's just good to know. It's just good to know, right? So if you're, it might take more than your 30 days till closing to, to figure this out. So plan ahead, get pre-approved yeah. with a lender that understands the situation. Yes, and you don't get pay stubs anymore. So I, right. that was another thing. You have to, you have to have pay stubs if you're buying a house. So yeah, but your HR department should still have them. You just don't get them anymore. So mine come um, to my mailbox. Oh. Okay. But the but the whole online thing. So if you like enter your time every month and you can go online and see how many sick days and you can see your, your last pay statement, that whole website just kind of goes dark for you and it's just a bunch of zeros everywhere. Um, so that that's just a, a logistical change in the day to day. Nobody's watching them anymore. So if you don't get the grant, remember, you're going to laugh. It's not all bad. <laughs> okay, we've gone 10 minutes over, so I want to make okay. sure that in case anybody has... Well, I don't know if you guys can say, let's thank our...